It's a little different than it uh, than it did a year ago. It's like things have changed just a bit. We've only talked once since uh, since June. I guess I should start again by saying congratulations on a, an incredible run a year ago. Well, I appreciate it, and so we're 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 a couple of days from opening day, so I don't know when this is going to air. Uh, but yeah, uh, one of the things that uh, we've had a lot of congratul uh, congratulations and a lot of pats on the back, but I think Friday at four, you know, that all ends. You know, you can't say congratulations, you know, from the year before. So, uh, looking forward to Friday. I was going to ask you about about turning the page, and maybe that's the the best place to start. Um, you you, you want to soak it in. You want to celebrate. Fans want to celebrate. But if you go into a new season thinking about what you accomplished last year, that feels like it's probably a recipe for disaster. It is. Um, you know, I, I don't know how, you know, an athlete in today's world or a coach in today's world would ever, you know, get to that point. Yeah, I think that's more for the fans. I think that's more for, hey, they better focus on this year. Yeah, I don't know. You know, of course, you know, what, what do you think we've been doing the last six months? Uh, uh, but one of the answers that, to, to that question that I've said to, to several people is, uh, you know, it wasn't easy or it wasn't hard to turn the page when you walk into the first team meeting on whatever date that was, August 20th, and uh, you look into the room and 20 of the guys, 20 of the 40 guys sitting in that room weren't here last year. And, uh, you know, they came here to win their ring. You know, and when you go to the governor's mansion in the first week of November uh, to be honored, you know, the team that you've been coaching for three months, half of those guys didn't get on the bus because they weren't on the team. You know, when you go to get recognized at halftime or walk through the grove of the Alabama football game, uh, these are all neat things and great things. But half the guys you've been coaching, you know, aren't part of that. And so, uh, you know, quickly, and I think that's what makes college athletics great, you know, that, that the teams change, that the new players uh, come in, new recruits, new transfers. And, you know, we, we've, you know, gosh, I'm sure your show has been covered up with Transfer Portal and NIL and all these other things that we talk about. Um, I think that we're in a, a time where uh, it's it, it should be easy to be able to put in a rear view mirror and move on. But we tried to challenge ourselves as well as to not take that away from the fans or the players that were part of that or to the coaches, but give it its place, you know, and it's places and in your everyday life, you know, 24 uh, seven, but it's good to have you know, great memories. And, but how can we use that to help us, you know, you know become a better baseball program? So uh, I, that, that was a long answer, probably longer than I meant it to be. But the truth is, you know, I don't think anybody's, you know, thinking about, you know, last year right now. I realize asking you to reflect on last June when you're two days from opening day maybe is a little bit unfair to you, so forgive me for that. Um, but, <laughs> but here we go. So you finished the College World Series. You get USA Baseball immediately after that, and, and you just dive right into it. When was the moment that you finally sat down on your back porch, had dinner with your wife, and and just kind of – took a deep breath and reflected? Um, you know, uh, first of all, don't, don't ever feel sorry for me. I live a great life and I've been very blessed and fortunate. So, uh, but it was a busy, busy summer and to, you know, uh, winning the championship, uh, and then two days later going to carry North Carolina, you know, that, that was, that was hard physically, probably mentally and emotionally, uh, there's a lot worse things in life. And, uh, and so uh, I, I don't really know the exact time and probably the best way to answer it is it probably was in different, you know, uh, layers, you know, like the you know, peeling back an onion, as they say. Um, I mean, sure, there was times, you know, probably, you know, that night. Uh, you know, that we won the championship. Uh, but there's different moments. I think, you know, everybody, when you have these gr great moments in your life, there's different things that you remember and, and things that you didn't, you, you forget, and then somebody reminds you of, you know. Uh, so now just thinking about them, thinking about how cool the parade was, how cool it was to have so many people here on that Wednesday night uh, that 15 minutes later we were on a jet flying to North Carolina. But before that, you're sitting here, you know, amongst, you know, 7,000 Ole Miss fans, you know, in a, in a celebration at our stadium. So there was so many, you know, cool moments. And, uh, but probably the breather part of it was probably mid August, you know, when we got back, we, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, 
a lot of a lot of visits, a lot of recruiting visits because I'd been gone, you know, and and so not just being gone for the USA team, we planned on that, but we were gone the whole month of June. We were gone from May, basically middle of May, you know. <laughs> uh, at one point, I think Cami and I counted uh, at least me personally, and you know, uh, I uh, in the past whatever fifty two days, you know, only forty one days were or, or forty one days were spent on the road of 51 days so don't we home 10 days and so yeah um but it's a it was a good busy you know we've been busy even through the fall but it's been a good busy yeah it's interesting i i, I would think that you've gotten lots of anecdotes from fans or people that you've talked to so the first Ole Miss baseball game i went to was in 1989 the first year of the new stadium the first game that i broadcast was your first year had season tickets as a kid, like use my grass cutting money mm-hmm. to, to buy season tickets. And randomly since the college world series, I've had moments where I'm like, did that really happen? Mm-hmm. Like that was unbelievable. And then to take it a step farther, it's like, okay, I've been doing this since I was nine years old, but I got to share that moment with all three of my kids mm-hmm. who love going to baseball as well. And it's like, they're these family ties that, that kind of go through generations, whether it's, grandfathers and sons or dads and daughters or dads and sons or cousins or whatever it 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 really is I don't even know if there's a question there other than just it's kind of it's kind of surreal to think about what happened and and kind of what all had gone into that well I I I will tell you that one of the coolest things uh and Cammy said it over and over uh, is to hear people's stories, to hear people's stories of how they got to Omaha. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I remember a story uh, of, a, I, I think, a, a woman and her father, I'm going to guess, was probably in his 70s or 80s, and it was her, his birthday coming up, and she said, hey, when we, when we beat Arkansas in the semifinals to get to the championship, she said, hey, do you want to go to Omaha? You know, we'll jump in a car and we'll drive and we'll get there. And and he's like, ah, nah, it's going to be too difficult. And, you know, nah, I don't want to do that. We'll watch it on TV. Much easier. We'll enjoy it here. And then the next morning he calls her at 6 a.m. and says, hey, listen, let's go to Omaha. And so they jumped in a car and drove to Omaha and watched the, the national the two, you know, the national championship series. And there's so many stories like that, so many stories of fathers, sons, fathers, daughters, um, how they got there, you know, all their mishaps along the way, flights being canceled uh it's it's really it's been really cool to hear all the people reminiscing about you know their experiences and i I think that was one of the things when people said hey did you know winning that what you know motions anything different I, i think that's one part of it is just you know listening to everybody how much you know it meant to everybody uh and hearing their journey you know along the way so that's been really cool and and then there were stories even within your team like T.J. McCants, whose mother hangs on mm-hmm. for dear life mm-hmm. to be able to see her son and, and said, you're going to play in Omaha, and then she got to see that. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, for yeah, your listeners that don't realize, you know, T.J.'s mom was diagnosed with cancer a couple of years ago when he was a freshman towards the end of his uh, freshman year. Uh, there was a time last year during the season that they didn't think she would make it. She came up here basically to say goodbye to him. Uh, and couldn't make it through the weekend. And uh, he flew home that week uh, to be with her and then flew back uh, the next weekend to meet us in Arkansas. I think in his very first at bat, he hit a home run at uh, at Arkansas on the road. Um, and, uh, yeah, she made it to, to Omaha. And uh, just really cool, really cool to, um, you know, moment obviously for for him that he'll he'll never forget but i mean uh you start to realize that you know even though we won a championship and you know uh, how many cool things that at the end of the day it's just a baseball game yeah. mike is that the and and we'll kind of turn the page after this to to this year's team is that the thing that maybe fans lose sight of is the the family piece that goes in with being part of a team and having guys around you that can kind of help you through the bad times in addition to being able to celebrate the good times? Wow. Tough, deep question. Um, I think my answer would be probably some fans, you know, they they want to win so much and, you know, you're kind of oblivious to all the work and all the things, all the blood, sweat and tears that go into it. Uh, Maybe to some people, but, you know, um, I, I don't think the majority, 
you know, I think the majority uh, appreciates. They appreciate these kids. They appreciate how hard they work. They appreciate the coaches. Um, they appreciate the grounds crew and everything that goes into making a baseball game. Yeah, there's there's always going to be that uh, uh, segment, you know, that, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, tend to be miserable, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but that's in everyday life, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and that's unfortunate, but I, I think most people realize, you know, that these are regular kids. They go to class, they, um, they, they have tough things. They, they have moms die of cancer. They have parents that the divorce, they break up with their girlfriend, you know, two hours before a game. Uh, um, they're regular people, you know, uh, the coaches are regular people. And, uh, you know, uh, but I think I, I think in my heart, I could be wrong. I think most people get that. With Mike Bianco, head baseball coach at Ole Miss, as we uh, get set for the start of the 2023 season. So no more questions about last year, or at least for now. Um, so turning the page to this team, uh, there are familiar faces that are coming back, maybe even more than people realize, but a lot of new faces that are, are rolling in as well as you begin kind of the start of a new journey. What What is the message to your team? You, you kind of go with a theme each year. Uh, so maybe let's start there, kind of what you're doing theme-wise with this team. Um, you know, what we, uh, as we talked about it, just going into the fall, you know, how, how do we use, you know, the, this championship uh, to better us, you know, not with pats on the back to feel good, but how do we, how do we use it recruiting wise? How do we use it, you know, uh, you know, with this, this existing team and so on. So there's a lot of different ideas and not to get, you know, too much into the weeds and, you know, a lot that I probably don't want to share on the air. Um, but one of the things that I thought was important uh, because this is a good mix. This is a good mix of returners. We return five of the starting nine in Omaha. Uh, we, we return uh, several pieces, you know, on the mound. Uh, but then you also welcome in the number two ranked recruiting class. You welcome in, you know, three or four transfers that I think will impact the program immediately. And uh, all of those things are good. But let's not lose sight, you know, of our foundation and who who we are and and how we got here. Um, and so, you know, we talked a lot about you know our core covenants, but uh, which is you know Rebs being relentless, excellence, belief, and selfless. But at the I think the core of the core covenants, if you will, is excellence. You know, being at your best every single day. You know, fundamentally sound. Just you know you know um, doing the things that you need to do and doing them at, to to to. Uh, uh, the best of your ability. And uh, so the uh, book that we read over the break was a book that we kind of recycled. We read it a few years ago called The Compound Effect. It's it's actually a kind of a self-improvement book by Darren Hardy, who was uh, the longtime editor of Success Magazine. And uh, for those that, that you know, read uh, or, you know, looking for a good kind of self-help book it's really it's not for athletes it's for everybody it's really you know for you know business people but uh, it's just really I think black and white how to be successful in anything if you're trying to lose weight if you're trying to make money if you're trying to uh, be a good athlete and um, and so that that was kind of the uh, the theme I think all fall and going into the spring is just trying to be the very best that you can be every single day you're gonna roll Hunter Elliott out there, uh, I assume on on opening day, um, kind of etched his name into into history because of the way he pitched, not just because of the stage, but because of how he pitched in big games. How will he be different in in year two as a as a starter, maybe than he was as a freshman? But because usually there is a learning curve. Yeah, you know, um, I think you know, there's one breath that you you want to say, hey, you don't really have to be different. You know, don't think that you have to. I think uh, everybody's built a little different, you know, and 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 what motivates them and what makes them better. Uh, obviously, everybody wants to improve and get better, but sometimes, uh, you know, more is less. You know, and uh, you know, trying to be too much or put too much on you. Uh, he's a great, great competitor. It's one of the reasons that he had so much success as a freshman, and as you mentioned, on the biggest stage. And so, uh, I, I don't think that is a. Uh, uh, a worry from uh, any of us. I think that's one of the things that we feel better about this pitching staff than last year in a sense that last year, even though Diamond had returned as a starter, uh, you know, he had never been the Friday night guy. And even though Hunter didn't, 
he pitched on some really big stages and he pitched against, you know, on those big stages against other people's number one. And so, um, and then he pitched internationally he won he was on the mound he was a starter in the bronze medal game against Japan. Um, you know, uh, he's a guy that can handle it. So I don't think that's a worry for any of us specifically, you know, what, what to improve on. We, we worked, um, uh, and he worked, you know, with Coach Lafferty um, uh, uh, very hard on improving his breaking ball. We thought that if you look at his game, the one area that he needs to improve on is probably his breaking pitch. Got an outstanding fastball, outstanding changeup, um, uh, but probably an average breaking ball at best, you know. Uh, and so uh, kind of combined both the slider and the curve to, to be more of just a slider. Uh, and I think that'll help him, you know, against left-handed hitters this year. And and so specifically, if you're getting to the nuts and bolts, that that's it. Uh, the other thing is, for all the guys, not just Hunter, is how do you accept that leadership role? How do you accept, uh, you know, it wasn't a secret that, you know, we had the success last year only because we had great leaders. And uh, now it's time for those those batons from Bench and Elko and Graham and Diamond and Chofi and all the guys last year that held it together. Uh, hand it to a new crew of guys, guys like Elliot and uh, Doherty and you know, Gonzalez and Harris and Alderman and you know, McCants and all those guys that you know didn't really have to play that role last year. They just had to be you know better baseball players. Now they they got to be better ba- baseball players that are leaders. What about this pitching staff as a whole? Um, you've got a, a a freshman that that people are raving about in, in Grayson Saulnier, a transfer in Xavier. Revis that maybe people haven't seen before or don't know about if they haven't been to practices or, or fall ball or any of those things, but, but just kind of the staff as a whole. Yeah, you know, we, we feel good about it. You know, it's it's not one of those staffs where we woke up, you know, a few years ago in 2021 where you re- returned to Casey and Hoagland and two SEC starters that were dominant, two guys that, you know, probably are going to be first or second rounders, you know, when when June comes along, along with a, a guy that pitched as a freshman in Derek Diamond and, you know, Taylor Broadway in the bullpen and some pieces that were kind of already set and you're just trying to find, you know, the pieces that connect to them. Yeah, this this a little more in depth, but I don't think as much as last year. I think last year, you know, there was a there was, you know, even though we felt like we had some talent in on, on the staff, we just didn't know where those pieces, you know, would fall. And so we just entered the the the, the spring, uh, hoping, you know, that some guys would accept some roles and and do well. And um, and I think we got fooled a little bit. Not so much. Uh, once we got through, we won our first nine games last year, but, you know, and we 10 run ruled, I think five of our first seven games or four of our first six games. Uh, so we were feeling probably pretty good about ourselves. Um, but we knew in this office that, you know, we, we weren't pitching as dominantly as we needed to, you know, once conference play started and, you know, and you know, that, that, uh, uh, reared its ugly head pretty quickly, you know, in conference that, you know, we were going to struggle on the mound. And once that went, you know, uh, we didn't hit it as well either. Um, and so I think we feel better about the pieces of this 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 team on the mound. And last year's team, uh, and I say this, you know, in the office because people forget because we talk, you know, we beat up last year's pitching staff. It just took us a long time to figure it out. Yeah. Once we figured it out, we were pretty good. <laughs> and you know, you know, we realized that you know we ended up fourth in the conference in pitching. If you're in the top four in the SEC in pitching, you're pretty good. And so now it took us you know 60 games to figure that out. But once we figured it out, we're pretty good. So hopefully we'll figure it out a little quicker this year. It might save a little heartburn along the yeah. way. Yeah. Um, visiting with Mike Bianco, Jacob Gonzalez. So he has the the freshman All American season. He was good a year ago. Numbers were down a little bit. He had that stretch in the postseason where it's like he just couldn't find a hit. And then at the very end, he comes up with these just massive hits, you know, one after another. And he gets, I guess there was a home run that was mixed in there as well. What do you say about him in this line of shortstops that you've had that have been so good now in his third year? He's been an everyday starter since he stepped on (laughs) campus. Well, he's a superstar. And, uh, and you know, really, the only number that was down last year was his batting average. He hit about two seventy, but he, he hit eighteen or nineteen home runs. Um, he walked like twenty or thirty more times than he struck out. Um, uh, I think he ended up making like twelve or fourteen errors, but he may have made three errors in Omaha. 
And so, like, you know, you're talking about a guy that made around 10 errors at shortstop at, you know, a very difficult position. Um, that's why he's, by most, you know, major league, you know, draft prognosticators, he's picked in the top five of, you know, uh, the guys that are going to be selected, you know, in the major league draft this summer. So with all that being said, uh, he's a star. And, uh, you know, I think cut out of the mold of a lot of the other great ones, Cozart and Kessinger and Robinson and a lot of guys that, you know, Servideo, um, uh, he would hold his own against any of those. But, uh, um, yeah, a guy that's, uh, I think, just a, a superstar and has showed it, you know, throughout not just his two years here. I mean, he's been a shortstop for the USA national team, for, you know, for two years in a row. Uh, just uh, just really good, you know, just a really good defender. Um uh, and just an excellent hitter, a kid that will hit for power, uh, will hit for average. Um, just uh, I'm glad he's wearing our uniform. There's some changes to the rules this year in, in college baseball. And yesterday on the show, we we went through some of these. I know you've talked about them a, a little bit, but with, with clocks, right? I mean, we're not used to seeing clocks in baseball other than maybe on top of the scoreboard, and it's one of those big, pretty clocks. Um there's been a clock on the the outfield wall for a few years that's largely been ignored, but this seems to be a point of emphasis. Pitch clock, uh, pitching change clock. You know, thirty seconds here, twenty seconds here, two and a half minutes here. Give us kind of your overview. Is this a big deal? How's it going to affect the game? Is it going to be a, a positive effect, net positive, long term? Well, just one, I guess, in general, so fans can just take a deep breath. The, the whole goal for the NCAA, which I agree, is, and they've been pushing this for, for a long time, uh, because of TV, because of fans, supposedly, uh, that they want to make the game faster. You know, they, 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 they cringe at a four-hour baseball game or a three-hour and three hour and 42-minute baseball game. Um, you know, some people enjoy that. They, they, they want to sit there and watch all the, you know, the uh, minute things that happen during a game. And, and I get that. Uh, but, but for, to make it more digestible for more fans, to make it more digestible for TV and ESPN and SEC network to fit it into the time schedules are trying to make the game faster. So how do you do that without changing the game, without making it a seven inning game, without playing two outs in an inning, without changing a bat. So people laugh and go, Oh, well, we'll never do that. Well, we changed the bats and, you know, to try to make the game faster, you know, so, uh, be careful what you think won't ever happen. Um, but their goal was like major league baseball and taking kind of an, uh, uh, a couple pages from their script was how can we make the game faster in the dead time? So when there's nothing being played, how can we speed up the game that won't won't necessarily affect the game or give anybody an advantage? And so those are in between innings, those are in between pitches, those are in between pitching changes and so on. So I don't know if you went through them, but some of the ones that people will be new to. So there will be a clock in, in you know on all the SEC fields. And the rules that I'm going to give you are SEC rules. Some of them are NCAA rules, some of them aren't, but they're all SEC rules where uh, the, the coach only has 30 seconds from the time he leaves the dugout uh, to go speak to, to a pitcher, uh, to make a pitching change or to just speak to him. So the clock starts once he you know, gets to, you know, what leaves the dugout, he has to leave the mound by 30 seconds. So you don't have the, somebody thinking that the coach is wasting time and it's kind of subjective how long he's allowed to be out there. So, so will you now jog to the mound as opposed to walking? I haven't decided yet. I, I don't know. I, I haven't practiced. That's probably the one thing of the clock we haven't practiced. We'll see. I, I, I will be keeping track of the time, though. Um, two and a half minutes from a time that, that you make a pitching change. So once you signal to the bullpen and, the, and the, the relief pitcher enters the field to play onto the warning track, he has two and a half minutes. Um, 30 seconds in between hitters and 20 seconds in between pitches, including with base runners. The difference in last year is last year, once a guy started his uh, set motion, so once he got the signal and started to put his hands together and come set, the clock would stop. And that's why there was so much when you stepped off, you had to feint the throw. You can't just step off because that you have to restart the clock again. And that would just, you know, kind of nullify the rule if you could come set and then step off. And so if you're trying to delay the game. So that's why they tried to put that in. Uh, this year, there is, uh, you're allowed to step off. You're allowed to feint the throw. But if you do step off or feint the throw with a runner on base, it's called a reset. And you get one reset per hitter. 
And so if you do it a second time, it's an automatic ball. The other big thing is when you come set, the clock doesn't stop. It doesn't stop until you actually go to deliver the ball to the plate, and you have 20 seconds to do that. So if you're holding the ball and the pitcher's not really paying attention, kind of like a, a play clock in football or a shot clock in basketball, if he doesn't deliver the pitch in 20 seconds, it's a ball. They'll call timeout and give it a ball. Uh, these times are kind of hardcore press times, unlike the clocks that you were talked about. That did help speed up the game because it made it, uh, umpires conscious of how much time it took Ole Miss to get back out on the field or Vanderbilt. If they were taking too much time, you could have an umpire run over and say, hey, you guys got to speed it up or whatnot. Now these are hardcore where there's going to be a ball called. And so, um, and the umpires are pressed to, to enforce the rules. It's not their fault. They didn't make the rules. It, they are what they are. So, you know, over the last month, you know, we've, we've, kind of trained and worked hard to hopefully not make it a problem. You said, will it be a problem? You know, um, our goal is for it to be a problem for somebody else, for us to be able to play within the rules, you know, that they state and try to do it comfortably and be able to play the game. There are some good strike zones out there. There are some less than good strike zones that are out there as well. For, for an umpire who already has plenty on his plate, is this asking them to do too much more to focus on too much beyond what's happening between the the chalk lines no because it won't be that umpire that's making the call it'll be the third base umpire you know uh and so the third base umpire is in charge of the clock the yeah. guy that probably has the least you know, amount of responsibility out there um so there, there's four of them out there so you know they they should be able to you know take care of that so no i, I you know i disagree with that I, I think you know it's more for them to know and responsibilities but uh uh you know at, at the end of the day you know, uh, again, they don't make the rules. They're, they're there to enforce them. Two more things for you. One, is college baseball healthy or and, – and if yes, is it healthier than it's been in a long time? Oh, I think so. Uh, you know, I think we continue to grow. Um, uh, when you, you, you look at all the variables that I would think uh, that you would – try to objectively grade it like where 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 we are now where we were 10 years from you know ago or five years ago or 20 years ago when you look at the facilities when you look at the attendance when you look at you know the money that's being spent by athletic departments the tv coverage the streaming um um i think it's as healthy as it's ever been uh, um and it, it's it's great it's great to be a part of i think it's a great time when you look at you know our conference but not just our conference all the you know conferences are, you know, around the country when you look at the college world series and um you know what what a neat experience and so many people that went to omaha you know talking they, they've never been and talk about you know what an experience you know they've been to so many bowl games and NCAA basketball tournaments, but that was their greatest sporting event ever. You know I heard that time and time again. Um, no, I think college baseball is uh, continuing to grow, and that's a good thing. Last thing, I was um, talking to a basketball coach at a shoot around last week. Uh, this is a guy, and I, and I was trying to be gentle. I said, "You are notoriously regimented," and he goes, "No, I'm OCD." I was like, "Okay, you said it, not me." I said, but you're playing really well right now. You've won 11 of your last 13. Are you allowing yourself to enjoy it along the way? And he said he's trying. He, he said, my wife reminds me of that all the time, but I see the big picture, and I don't know if my guys do or whatever. So modification of that question, national championship in the rearview mirror, start of a new season. There's so much to focus on and worry about. The SEC's a grind. Do you allow yourself consciously to enjoy the journey? Um, I think that's kind of a, a, a trick question, uh, going into that you just won a national championship last year and you're two days away from, you know, starting the season. I think I've tried to do what I've always done. I, I think probably if I'm honest over time, I've, I've learned to, um, I don't, I wouldn't call myself OCD, my wife may, but I, I wouldn't call myself OCD, um, <laughs> But I'm, uh, I'm a guy that's uh, routine-oriented, a guy that tries to be excellent, a guy that um, has a, a routine himself and a system and the way we go about things in this program. And everybody in you know, this office, everybody in that locker room understands that and thinks that's the reason that we have success. It's been really, I think, my job individually, personally, to decide what things matter and what things don't. You know what things are going to help us win 
uh, and what things, you know, control what you can control, right? Uh, worry about the things that, you know, that are going to matter and help us win. The other things try to let slide. That's hard for people that are built like me and maybe that coach. But I think as you get older, you get wiser and you start to realize that. So it's not caring less. It's caring less about the things that don't matter, you know, and, and that's where everybody thinks, hey, you know, the, the coaches are getting old, you know, that, that coach is getting older and he's getting, you know, easier on the team or, you know, he's changing his ways. He's probably getting wiser to the things that, you know, don't matter as much. So I'm going to let that slide. I think that's part what everybody does, not just coaches, but adults and, you know, grandfathers and, you know, everybody starts to realize what's really important and what's not. So I don't think it's, hey, did I enjoy, I enjoyed coaching when I was 30, um, uh, but a lot more things bothered me probably when I was 30 than they bother me now. Thanks so much for your time.